Anybody that has listened to Father Wade knows he, it's a treat to hear what he has to say. But if you haven't, get ready. Because he is incredible. Let me read a little bit about his bio, though, for you. Uh, Father Wade Manesis is a member of the Fathers of Mercy, a missionary preaching religious congregation based in Auburn, Kentucky. Ordained a priest during the Great Jubilee Year 2000, he received his Bachelor of Arts degree in Catholic Thought from the Oratory of St. Philip Neri in Toronto, Canada, and has a dual Master of Arts and Master of Divinity degrees in Theology from the Holy Apostle Seminary in Cromwell, Connecticut. His secular college degrees are in journal, journal, Journalism and Communications. Father Wade is currently the Assistant General and has served as Director of Vocations and the Director of Seminarians for the Fathers of Mercy. Father Wade has also served as a chaplain in residence at the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament of Our Lady of Angels Monastery in Hansville, Alabama. While at the Shrine, Father Wade was a daily Mass celebrant, homilist, and confessor. He also gave spiritual conferences on specialized points of Catholic Christian doctrine to the many people that pilgrim there. Both the monastery and the shrine are affiliated with EWTN. Father Wade has also been a guest on various episodes of EWTN's Mother Angelica Live, Life on the Rock, Life on the Rock programs. Uh, he's discussed topics as the sanctification of marriage and family life, vocations in the sacred liturgy. He's the host of the EWTN segment series, The Crux of the Matter and the wonder of his mercy. He's the author of the four last things, which he mentioned, the four last things, a catechetical guide to death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And he's the host of the EWTN Global Catholic Radio's Open Line Tuesday. So you can hear Father Wade. If you like what you had to hear today from him, you can hear him every week. And we should, we all should be doing that. So that, uh, on just one quick personal note, Father Wade, when I talked to him, when we discussed him coming here, he goes, Kyle, he goes, Kyle, just uh, you need to start praying to St. Joseph for intercession. Because St. Joseph is the terror of demons. And he goes, when men start planning to go out for the Lord and do things, events like this, Satan's going to come after you. So our group, along with all us men, we need to be praying to St. Joseph for that intercession and uh, help strengthen it. So, Father, we're so glad you're here. Thank Good you. morning once again, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here with all of you today, all day, for the larger group now of 200 and the smaller group this afternoon of around 20. And I was told that if some of you who are not yet planning to stay for the smaller group in the afternoon, it is possible for you to ask to be there this afternoon as well. And we close with the Vigil Mass uh, for Sunday, so you could sleep in tomorrow morning, amen? amen? All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us close our eyes and just really absorb these words that I'm about to lead you now in prayer, because this prayer conveys truthfully and beautifully and deeply what I hope you will get from this talk. Heavenly Father, we humbly beseech you to make us more faithful sons of your Son's Church. Help us to be joyful, knowledgeable Catholics living in the midst of the modern world, so that we may be beacons of light shining forth in defense of the Church's sacred scriptures, sacred tradition, and magisterium, her teaching office. Help us always to cultivate the virtues of faith, hope, and charity in our daily lives so that whether single or married or as consecrated bishops, priests, deacons, or religious, we may always share your truth with others. We ask this through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, Mother of the Church, 
Saint Joseph, terror of demons. Pray for us. Yesterday's patron saint on the universal calendar, Saint Luke the Evangelist. Pray for us. And today's saints on the universal calendar, especially here in North America, for Canada and the United States, Saint John de Brebeuf and companions, Jesuit martyrs, known as the North American martyrs, and our own guardian angels and patron saints. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you're able, please stand for the Gospel. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Pilate then abruptly went back inside the palace. He summoned Jesus immediately and asked him, are you or are you not the king of the Jews? Jesus asked him in reply, is that your own idea or did others talk to you about me? Pilate replied to him, am I a Jew? Listen, your own people and chief priests have handed you over to me. What is it exactly you have done? Jesus replied, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest right now by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Pilate said to him, so you are a king then? Jesus answered Pilate and said to him, it is you who say that I am a king. And in fact, the very reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. And everyone who is on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate retorted, truth, what is truth? The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. In defense of faith and truth, our Catholic calling is the title of this conference. You can see in the red wording there at the bottom of the screens. In defense of faith and truth, our Catholic calling. What a great talk and a great title to give to a group of Catholic men leaders representative of their different parishes in this greater Dallas area. Amen? Amen. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, as Pope Benedict XVI during his April 2008 visit to the United States, on his birthday, standing on the south portico of the south lawn of the White House, said these words to a group of over 4,000 people gathered there, quote, what the world lacks today is seekers of truth. There are plenty of seekers of pleasure and plenty of seekers of power, but not enough seekers of truth. And in John 14, 6, we have Jesus comforting his disciples. He says to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. St. Thomas Aquinas, the great doctor of the church, one of the church's 36 doctors, he says that errors perish and cease to be when people get to know and embrace the truth. And we know from John 14, 6, that truth is a person, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. Again, Thomas Aquinas, errors perish and cease to be when people get to know the truth. St. Edith Stein, the great Carmelite Auschwitz martyr, who was formerly an agnostic turned atheist, then almost became a Lutheran, but because of Lutheran friends and their influence, in a good way, actually decided to become Catholic. She ended up joining the Carmelite convent as a cloistered nun, continued her philosophical writings with the permission of her mother superior, and was martyred at Auschwitz because of her Jewish heritage. I like to affectionately refer to her as one of my girlfriends in heaven. I have several there. But Edith Stein, she once says this, quote, do not accept anything as the truth if it lacks love, and do not accept anything as love which lacks the truth. Why? 
because one without the other becomes an absolute destructive lie. Do not accept anything as the truth if it lacks love, and do not accept anything as love which lacks the truth. Why? Because one without the other becomes an absolute destructive lie. One of the founders of Christendom College in Front Royal, Virginia, is Dr. Warren Carroll, who's now deceased. But for those who knew him and attended his classes, because he was also a professor at Christendom College in Front Royal, Virginia, know that he would frequently, frequently, frequently say a certain quote, short and to the point. So much so did Dr. Warren Carroll, one of the founders of Christendom College, frequently say this quote, that even today in 2019, if you go to the gift shop on campus, you could buy a coffee cup with his effigy on it, with the quote underneath his effigy. And the quote is this, truth exists, the incarnation happened. Quote, end quote. Two short sentences side by side. Amen? Amen. Truth exists, the incarnation happened. Because again, truth is a person. Pope Francis recently said in one of his Wednesday audiences, truth according to the Christian faith is God's love for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Therefore, truth is a person and love of truth is a relationship. Going back to St. Edith Stein, she also says this, God is truth, and whoever seeks the truth is seeking God, whether they know it or not. God is truth, and whoever seeks the truth is seeking God, whether they know it or not. And we know from 1 John 4 that God is love. So love and truth, again, going back to Edith's first quote, do not accept anything as love which lacks the truth, and do not accept anything as the truth which lacks love. Why? Because one without the other becomes an absolute destructive lie. God is truth, she says, and whoever seeks the truth is seeking God, whether they know it or not. And 1 John 4, God is love. Monsignor Charles Pope, who I respect very greatly, I think is one of the greatest Catholic writers today in 2019 in the United States, he blogs for the National Catholic Register out of Washington, D.C. He says, quote, this is what love does. It speaks the truth and warns of error. How's that for a bumper sticker? This is what love does. It speaks the truth and warns of error. Now, speaking of error, my brothers, it's no secret that every 500 years, the church goes through particular trials and tribulations, many of which are caused from within her own ranks, dissidents within her own ranks. Now, this isn't any type of a Nostradamian calculation to predict the future, not at all. It's just a plain fact. Around the year 500, we were dealing in the church with the great Christological and Gnostic heresies against the Holy Spirit and our Lord, the second and third persons of the Trinity. In 1054, around the year 1000, we have the great split between East and West, a fight of jurisdiction primarily between Rome and Constantinople. In the 1500s, we have the Protestant Reformation, in part with good reason because of the corruption within the church. Not to blame the church, but again to blame her dissidents. We know her by her four marks, the Bride of Christ. She is, help me out here, she is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. But we know that her individual members can falter. But she herself as an institution is indefectively holy. And in the 2000s now, we're dealing with the great heresies of secular humanism and relativism and the clerical abuse scandals. I absolutely refuse to call them the priestly scandals because bishops are involved as well. Deacons are involved as well. And so we call them appropriately so the clerical scandals. St. Eusebius, great early church father, 
Before beginning a very controversial church council, the heavily pro-Arian Council of Milan in 355 AD, he himself, St. Eusebius, was a staunch opponent of Arianism. And so he insisted that all bishops present at this council in 355, the heavily pro-Arian Council of Milan, he insisted that all present attest to the truth by jointly signing their signatures to full agreement with the Nicene Creed, which was passed 30 years earlier in 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea. Now there's a wise church father right there. Gentlemen, we're here to bicker and fight and decide on Arianism, which denies the divinity of Jesus Christ as the second person of the Trinity. Fine, we're going to do that. But before we do that, let us not forget what we did 30 years earlier in Nicaea, in 325. And let us pin our signatures right now to those 47 truths that even today in 2019, we espouse every Sunday at Mass in the Nicene Creed after the homily. Then and only then, gentlemen, after we sign our signatures to what we did 30 years ago, will we have the grace to debate Arianism. And Arianism at the Council of Milan was stomped out. Because it was just that, a heresy. In defense of faith and truth, our Catholic calling, we know the truth through the three-legged stool of the church. What is it? We prayed about it in our opening prayer when I asked you to close your eyes and absorb the words as I lead you in that prayer. Sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium, the teaching office of the church, which itself is rooted in the apostolic college of the original twelve called by our Lord. And we knew there was one dissident in that group who ended up committing suicide. Sacred scripture, sacred tradition in the magisterium from the Latin word magister, which means teacher, the teaching authority of the church, are what present to us the truth, what we need to know, to believe, to put ourselves personally, individually, in the path of salvation. And the grace that comes from God, which is always a gratuitous gift, is just that gratuitous gift. But because we know the truth through the three-legged stool, whether or not abortion is good and true or not, whether euthanasia is good or true or not, whether adultery or gay marriage are good and true or not, we know from this three-legged stool. We know from scripture, tradition, and the magisterium. And all that this three-legged stool proposes is worthy of belief to put ourselves personally in the path of salvation is safeguarded by what's called the deposit of faith. The deposit of faith, quoting the Catechism of the Catholic Church, is that heritage of the one holy Catholic and apostolic faith contained in sacred scripture and sacred tradition, and which is handed on in the church from the time of the apostles, from which the magisterium, that is the teaching office of the church, draws all that it proposes for belief as being divinely revealed. That'd make another great bumper sticker if it wasn't so long. <laughs> so that we may be faithful to and adhere to these, the three-legged stool and the sacred deposit of faith that safeguards the three-legged stool, we do so to put ourselves in the path of salvation. St. Boniface, early church bishop and martyr, said, the truth can be assaulted but never defeated or falsified. The truth can be assaulted but never defeated or falsified. And boy, is it assaulted today. The Catechism continues in number 890. The task of the magisterium of the church, that is her teaching office, is to preserve God's people from deviations and defections from the truth in order to guarantee them the objective possibility of professing the one true faith without error. 
This mission of the magisterium is linked profoundly to the definitive nature of the covenant established by God with his people in Jesus Christ. And so we say that Catholicism is the sole legitimate heir of Judaism. Catholicism is the sole legitimate heir of Judaism. We know the truth. It's been revealed. I have a dear Protestant friend of mine in California. I remember him asking me years ago, how do you even know that God exists? And I responded, because he's a revealed God. He has revealed himself. St. Edith Stein, again, St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, the Carmelite Auschwitz martyr, she says, living faith is the firm conviction that God exists. The acceptance as truth of all that has been revealed by God and a loving readiness to be led by the divine will itself. And your leadership in the church, gentlemen, calls you to embrace this. What a gift. And this afternoon in my two talks to the smaller group, which hopefully will become a larger group, I'm going to talk about how the five bodily senses of sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing, and the four faculties of the soul, which is immaterial, intellect, will, memory, and imagination, how these nine great gifts, the five bodily senses and the four faculties of the soul, work together to embed us in the truth, in concrete daily actions, well lived and well carried out. Our body-soul compositeness as human persons is meant to elevate us to the heights of God's grace. The problem is, sight can be adversely affected by pornography. Taste can be adversely affected by too much drink. Etc., etc. Memory can be adversely affected by hanging on to your past sins, even though you've already confessed them. The devil continues to make you the dog that keeps returning to its vomit like scripture tells us not to do. But because you can't forgive yourself of your past sins, even though you've already forgiven them, have them forgiven in confession, you keep going back to them and keep beating yourself up over them like the dog that returns to its vomit in the Old Testament. Instead, these five bodily senses and the four faculties of the soul are meant to be elevated with God's grace. Raise your hand if you know who Flannery O'Connor was. Flannery O'Connor, another one of my girlfriends in heaven. She died of lupus at age 42, lame woman, single, never married. Born and raised in Georgia. Loved the Catholic faith deeply. Wrote with great wit, a few long stories, but mostly short stories. And she once wrote this about her Catholic faith. Quote, you shall know the truth indeed. And the truth shall make you very odd. <laughs> Gives you an idea of her wit in her writing. Someone once wrote her and said, Your short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, greatly, greatly left a bad taste in my mouth. Flannery responded to the person, You weren't supposed to eat it. <laughs> Regarding Flannery O'Connor seeking the truth and embracing it, she says this, quote, All of my stories, especially the short stories, are about the action of God's grace on a character who is not very willing to support it. But most people think of these stories as hard, hopeless, and brutal cases. They are not. I have found in short from reading my own writings that my subjects in fiction always, always come face to face with the action of God's grace in territory largely held by the devil. When grace comes face to face with these characters, they are free to accept it or reject it. Raise your hand if you know specifically the short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find. 
I would encourage you men to find it online and read it. A good man is hard to find. And at the very end, when she asks, the grandmother asks, the young murderer, why have you killed all of my family members? You seem like such a good, good young man. And the grandmother goes out to stroke the murderer's cheek. That's the image of God's grace being offered to the young murderer. The grandmother's stroke. And what's he do in the very next scene? He shoots the grandmother dead. He rejected God's grace. A good man is hard to find. Probably one of her most popular short stories. Flannery stories often feature grotesque characters encountering the harsh reality of truth and the mystery of God's divine grace. They are about the impact of supernatural grace on human beings who don't have a chance of spiritual growth without it. Her stories often focus on difficult characters experiencing powerful spiritual epiphanies that they are free to either accept or reject. In Flannery's stories, especially her short ones, she critiques secular humanists and seeks solutions, who seek solutions to human problems that ignore God and His grace and disregard the innate yearning that all individuals have for a relationship with the divine. While often described by literary scholars as a Southern Gothic or Southern grotesque writer, O'Connor preferred to describe herself as, quote, a Christian realist. Her short stories and personal letters often address issues like racism, immigration, Christian morality, salvation, the seven sacraments, and spiritual awakening. Although most of her stories do not explicitly expound on Catholic theology or feature specifically Catholic characters, her Catholic worldview is very obvious. Additionally, in numerous personal letters, O'Connor defended the Catholic Church's teachings on the Eucharist and the doctrine of the real presence, purgatory, the ban on artificial contraception, and the sacrament of marriage. In her prayer journal, she once wrote, quote, O oh God, please let Christian Catholic principles permeate my writing, and please let there be enough of my writing published to help permeate Christian Catholic principles in society. I dread, O oh Lord, of ever, ever losing my Catholic faith. In short, Flannery's writings, letters, and daily prayer demonstrate clearly an adherence to traditional Catholic morals and theological tenets. Throughout her adult life, O'Connor attended daily Mass and went to confession frequently, often once every two weeks. She stated that her Catholic sacramental view of life is what shaped her writing. She believed very strongly, in fact, that God works in often disruptive and mysterious ways to bring his prodigal children back to him often in unexpected moments of grace that are brought about by a second party. She loved her faith dearly, and she brought her faith out in her work, gentlemen. You are called to bring out your Catholic faith in your work. Again, regarding author Flannery O'Connor, someone once wrote a letter to Flannery complaining to her about her short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, that particular story left a very bad taste in my mouth. She immediately wrote back to the person, you weren't supposed to eat it. <laughs> now, how can you truly love and care for the truth while at the same time not promulgating? This truth we know through the person of Jesus Christ, that truth is a relationship that we know by the three-legged stool of sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium, safeguarded by the deposit of faith. St. Paulinus, early church father, says, Our love for truth must be very great, so great, in fact, that all our words must possess the value of oaths in everyday conversation. Our love for truth must be very great, so great, in fact, that all our words must possess the value of oaths in everyday conversation. Reminds me of Proverbs 8, where we read, from my lips will come what is right, and from my mouth will come the truth. Our prayer could be, Father of all truth, 
In the name of your Son and through the Holy Spirit, teach me to revere the truth in my daily life. Let my five senses and my four faculties of the soul lead me always to avoid falsehood in any and all forms. Who's the father of all lies? Satan. Satan, the devil. Father Casey makes that clear on that one talk of that CD set. Show me a person who leaves their Catholic faith. God willing, they'll become a revert back to the faith. Chances are, because they quit the sacraments, no longer go to Mass, no longer go to confession. The only two of the seven sacraments that can be received over and over and over again with much frequency. Chances are, and I can say this very objectively because I'm speaking in general terms here, I'm not pointing to John Smith or Susie Smith particularly. They left the faith and they quit practicing the faith. Chances are, chances are, it stems from a moral issue. And I make that point very clear in my set, The Return of the Prodigal, How to Re-Evangelize All the Way Catholics Back to the Faith. That's why I wanted to include a talk on that set of about 20 saints who suffered from particular issues, dependencies, and addictions that caused them to leave the faith. Augustine with his lust, Padre Pio with his anger, Marguerite de Vuelville with a nasty mother-in-law who not tried only to kill her once, but her mother-in-law tried to kill her twice. Can you imagine? The lives of the saints, huh? Can you imagine your own mother-in-law, gentlemen, not once, but twice, trying to kill you? Maybe you can. <laughs> How about St. Camillus with his gambling addiction? The list goes on and on and on. I want to talk about this pursuance of faith and truth now in the concept of only the church. Only about the church. St. Hilary of Poitiers, early church bishop in France, says, It is the very peculiar property of the church, very peculiar in fact, that whenever she is buffeted, she is triumphant. Whenever she is assaulted with argument, she proves herself in the right. And whenever she is deserted by her supporters, often liberal ones, she still holds the field strongly. Yeah, because she's indefectibly holy. She's the bride of Christ that we know by her four marks, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. But her members can err. Pope St. Gregory the Great says, it is better that scandals be exposed than for the truth to be suppressed. Amen? Amen. Now that would make a great bumper sticker. It is better for scandals to be exposed than for the truth to be suppressed. Let's look a moment here at the priestly and Episcopal clerical scandals. The clerical, clerical scandals and crimes in this country have caused just that, scandals and crimes, along with infidelity and broken trust and hurt among the people of God, the lay faithful. My brothers know this. There is no greater instrument in God's hands than a good and holy priest, and similarly there is no greater instrument in the devil's hands than a bad and evil priest. Know this, the devil's after priests. Why? I'll tell you why. No priests, no mass. No mass, no Eucharist. No Eucharist, no Jesus truly present. No Jesus truly present, no church which is his bride. No church which is his bride, no vehicle of salvation. No vehicle of salvation, no salvation. And no salvation means only one thing, and it begins with a D, damage. No priest, no mass, no mass, no Eucharist, no Eucharist, no Jesus truly present. No Jesus truly present, no church which is his bride. No church which is his bride, no vehicle of salvation. No vehicle of salvation, no salvation, no salvation, means only damnation. Think about it. It's 2 a.m. and you're experiencing a heart attack. It's awakening you from sleep. 2 a.m. 
Who are you going to call? And don't say Ghostbusters either. <laughs> you going to call the Knights of Columbus, Grand Knight, yes or no? You going to call the parish organist, yes or no? You going to call the Legion of Mary Presidium leader, yes or no? No, you're going to call the priest, is who you're going to call. I remember a gentleman sitting next to me one time on a plane, and very proudly, he says, oh, this church, I'm yeah, a cradle Catholic, but for sure I haven't practiced in about 20, 25 years, please, Father, please. Do you want the last rites when you die? <laughs> Sir, I asked you a question. Do you want the last rites when you die? He had no answer. Because down deep in his heart of hearts, he knows damn well, and I use the word damn against the devil, he knows damn well he wants the last rites. He knows it innately. He knows it. Pope Benedict XVI, regarding the church's clerical abuse, scandals, and crimes, he states the world without God can only be a world without meaning without standards of good and evil, and what constitutes both, where power is only the principle and truth does not count any longer. A society without God means the end of human freedom, and Western society is one where God is absent and has nothing left to offer it. To begin to correct all this, Benedict says, what is required first and foremost is the renewal of the faith and the reality of Jesus Christ given to us truly present in the most blessed sacrament. In fact, in conversations with victims of pedophilia, I have been made acutely aware of this truth. Devotion to Jesus' true presence in the blessed sacrament is where healing begins for both parties. Now, we can talk about the clerical scandals all we want, and indeed we should, no doubt. I just did. I can give you a whole 55-minute conference just on the clerical scandals. But let us not forget the lay scandals either, of the laity. What do I mean by that? I mean 67% of married Catholics contracept. I mean 69% of Catholics married and single believe in unnatural marriage. I mean that 38% of Catholics believe in euthanasia. These are absolutely scandalous statistics caused by you, the laity. Now, I don't know about you, but I want true healing to take place. And true healing is not going to take place with only the clerics. It's going to only truly take place with the propagation of faith and truth in the person of Jesus Christ, safeguarded by his private church, and both clerics and laity embracing that truth. That's how healing is going to come about. St. Augustine says, in this life, the church is shaken by various trials, as if by rains, floods, and tempests, but she does not fail, because she is founded upon the rock from which Peter received his name from Jesus Christ. And St. John Chrysostom, early church father, says, Never separate yourself from the church. No institution has the power of the church as the bride of Christ. The church is your hope. The church is your salvation. The church is your refuge of faith and truth. Colossians 1.18 says, It is Christ who is head of the body, the church. And our prayer could be, Lord Jesus, grant me the grace to adhere to the church and her teachings all my life. Let me encounter you, especially in her sacraments here on earth, and so possess eternal life with you in heaven. Amen. One of my two talks this afternoon for the smaller group is on the seven sacraments and how we need to embrace and live the sacraments. Important side note from history regarding the church. Cardinal Reginald Pole, from his opening comments at the Council of Trent in 1546 at Rome, 
He says, quote, it is we bishops who are most responsible for all the evils now burdening the flock of Christ. We cannot even name any other cause and its starting point than ourselves as bishops. If God punished us as we deserved, gentlemen, we should have been long since Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed. Unless we place our own sinful responsibility as bishops in the front of our minds, it is useless now to call upon the Holy Spirit for help to change this tide of Protestantism around. He was an English bishop. Those were from his opening comments at the Council of Trent in 1546 at the Vatican in Rome. He was a man with guts. A man with guts. St. Ambrose says to bishops, you have entered upon the office of bishop, sitting at the helm of the church. You now pilot the ship against the waves of evil. And so I tell you, bishop, take firm hold of the rudder of faith so that the severe storms of this world cannot disturb you nor your office. The sea is mighty and vast, but do not be afraid. For as scripture says, Christ has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters and the rock of Peter. The church of the Lord is built upon the rock of the apostles with Peter as its head among so many dangers in the world. It remains therefore unmoved. Indeed, the church's foundation is unshakable and firm against the assaults of the raging sea. True enough, waves lash out of the church but do not shatter it because they can't. And although the elements of this world constantly beat upon the church with crashing sounds, the church possesses the safest harbor of salvation for all in distress. Now this last seven or eight minutes was about the church and its crisis of faith and truth. We're talking about the scandals, both lay and cleric. Now I want to talk about the crisis of faith for nations and governments. Both Pope John Paul II and Pope Paul VI said, quote, nations that abandon the truth become totalitarian in nature, end quote. And both of those popes are canonized now, John Paul II and Pope Paul VI. Nations that abandon the truth become totalitarian. George Weigel, the official biographer of John Paul II, says, quote, freedom absent from moral truth becomes its own worst enemy, and a democracy without values becomes self-cannibalizing. Freedom absent from moral truth becomes its own worst enemy, and a democracy without values becomes self-cannibalizing. Now listen to this. If there's two homework assignments from this talk, this 50-minute talk, okay, 55-minute talk, <laughs> the first homework assignment is to read Flannery O'Connor's short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, and see God's grace being extended to the murderer at the end of the story, which he rejects by shooting the grandmother of this family that had gone camping, escaped convict, who came upon the family. Your second homework assignment is to listen to what I'm about to read now, just merely listen to it. It's a quote that's often attributed to an unnamed University of Edinburgh, Scotland professor from the 18th century. Quote, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. History has proven this time and again, because a democracy always ends up collapsing over loose fiscal policy. And it has always been followed by a dictatorship. The average age of the world's greatest civilizations has been for around 270 years. The reason for this? Great nations rise and fall. This is because the people go from bondage to spiritual truth. From spiritual truth to great courage. From great courage to liberty, and from liberty 
to abundance, but from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependence, and from dependence back again to bondage. A democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government because a democracy always ends up collapsing over loose fiscal policy and has always been followed by a dictatorship. The reason for this, the people go from bondage to spiritual truth, from spiritual truth to great courage, from great courage to liberty, and from liberty to abundance. But from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependence, and from dependence back again to bondage. I quote this in my talk on the third millennium culture that I do with Father Bill Casey, which also includes his talk on the reality existence of Satan in the culture. I want to bring this to a close now. Pope St. John Paul II in 1976, two years before he was elected as Pope John Paul II, so he's still Cardinal Carol Wojtyla here in this quote. It's from 1976 in his farewell address to the Eucharistic Congress in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the birth city of this great nation of ours, these 50 states. Huh? He says this in Philadelphia, standing in front of the State House, quote, We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. I do not even think that the wide circle of the American society or the wide circle of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, indeed between Christ and the anti-Christ. This confrontation, however, lies within the plans of divine providence. It is therefore in God's plan, and it must be a trial which the church must take up and face courageously. We must prepare ourselves to suffer great trials before long, such as will demand of us a disposition to give up even life and a total dedication to Christ and for Christ. With your and my prayers, dear American people, it is possible now to mitigate the coming tribulation but it is no longer possible to avert it, because only thus can the church be effectually renewed. How many times has the renewal of the church sprung from the shedding of blood? This time, too, it will not be otherwise. We must be strong and prepared and trust in Christ and in his Holy Mother, whom your great country is under her patronage of the Immaculate Conception. And we must be very, very assiduous in praying the Most Holy Rosary. And I add, also very, very assiduous in praying the Divine Mercy Chapel, which you did this morning in Saul. St. Jose Maria Scriba, the founder of Opus Dei, which he founded for laity, huh? he didn't find it for clerics. It was only later that clerics were allowed to join Opus Dei, Latin for work of God. He found it for, for laity. Any Opus Dei members here? A couple? Jose Maria Escriva says, compromising on a moral truth is a sure sign of not possessing the truth. When a man yields in matters of ideals, of honor, or of faith, let me tell you this, that same man is without ideals, without honor, and without faith. And Father John Harden, the great American Jesuit who died at the end of the Jubilee year 2000, he says, I want to give you four questions in which to help you discern the truth. Follow these and you will never separate yourself from the truth. Number one, ask yourself this. Does what I am hearing or reading about right now correspond to what the church has always held to be true? according to her scriptures, her traditions, and her magisterium. If it does, you can trust it. If it does not, distrust it. 
Again, say you're hearing somebody talk about the benefits of abortion. Does what, am I, does what I am hearing or reading about right now correspond to what the church has always held to be true? If it does, you can trust it. If it does not, distrust it. Number two, ask yourself this. Does what I am hearing or reading about right now conform to the present teaching of the Roman Catholic Church as expressed by the Vicar of Christ on earth, the Roman Pontiff, in continuity with sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium throughout the ages? If it does, you can trust it. If it does not, distrust it, no matter how otherwise pious or scholarly the opinion or theory may be. Because in the end, that's all it is, an opinion or theory. And it should be treated accordingly as an opinion or theory. Number three, ask yourself this question. This is a big one for today. Just watch Fox News at night. What kind of person morally is the one who is teaching or writing about or being interviewed about the thing I currently hear or read about? If, is he or she humble and prayerful and charitable and patient and chaste or the opposite of these things? More than once, in fact, the Savior used this norm, and he wants us to use it too, to explain why his critics who wrought finally murder, murdered him through crucifixion, the scribes and the Pharisees, were not teaching the truth. Their pride and their envy against Christ among their other vices, as he said, disqualified them from being taken seriously. And number four, what are the consequences of the ideas that I am currently hearing or reading about? Again, the Savior is our master in applying this precious norm when he tells us that, quote, by their fruits you shall know them. Ideas have consequences. True ideas have good consequences. False ideas have bad ones. There is no escaping the logic of this divinely ordained law of spiritual fertility, and it's this. The truth always begets goodness and virtue. Falsehood always begets evil and vice. These four questions posed by Father Hardin to ask ourselves to never leave the truth reminds me of Romans 12, 2, quote, Do not conform yourselves to this age, but rather be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that you may judge what is God's will, what is good, pleasing, and perfect for you and your growth in truth. St. Pope Paul VI says, Christians must aspire to be, with and through Christ, great witnesses to the modern world, of the truth that frees us and sets us free. Christians must therefore be educated in the following of the truth, both in their words and in their daily actions. And then he quotes James 3.14, refrain from making boastful, arrogant, and false claims against the truth. And again, Thomas Aquinas, who I quoted at the beginning, he who does not speak the truth also betrays it for it must be freely spoken. Also, he who does not defend the truth boldly also betrays it, for it must be boldly defended. Raise your hand if you know who Abby Johnson is, the great convert from the abortion industry and convert to the Catholic faith, a former pro-abortion facility director turned pro-life activist who now helps abortion facility staff leave the industry. The movie Unplanned is about her conversion story. Raise your hand if you saw Unplanned. Quite a few of you have, praise God. If you haven't seen it yet, order it from Ignatius Press and make a family movie night out of it. Literally, a family movie night of Unplanned. Order it from IgnatiusPress.com. Have it in your home Catholic DVD library. She writes, quote, I know for a fact I would not be at the place I am now on this healing journey if it hadn't been for the Catholic Church. Her jewels, such as the seven sacraments, Eucharistic adoration, and the Church's explicit teachings on God's mercy and forgiveness have helped me tremendously. The Church helps people to understand sin and its reality and how to be free of it. Amen. And lastly, number 675 from the Catechism. 
I close with this. Number 675, I see quite a few of you taking notes. 675 of the Catechism. Quote, before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception offering people an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which the human person glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And look at all the sins against the flesh today. Even the fact that Facebook now espouses 56 different genders. If that's not a direct attack on the dignity of the human person in Genesis 1, made in the image and likeness of God, male and female, he created them. In his own image and likeness, he made them. I don't know what is. Satan is so bold, so brash, it's almost as if, not almost as if, it's as if he wants to create a literal, subsisting, anti-creation to the very creation that God made. And we see this in the whole modern gender theory movement, which really escalated after June of 2015 when gay marriage passed. That's when the whole bathroom issue began. We never had the bathroom issue before gay marriage passed. And we can see that all these things are linked. Gentlemen, you have your task cut out for you as leaders in the Catholic Church. And we clerics, need you. I know I do. I need you gentlemen badly. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Our Lady's Seat of Wisdom, Mother of the Church, St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, St. Luke the Evangelist, Pray for us. North American Martyrs, Pray for us. our own guardian angels and patron saints, Pray for us. in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.